It's one of the classic chess fantasies. You've got your pet opening line, and in the perfect moment, you deploy it against a legendary opponent winning a decisive and brilliant victory. This is exactly what happened when Milan Vidmar played the Budapest Gambit against the great Akiba Rubinstein in this game. Rubinstein opens the game here with pawn d4, and we get knight f6, c4, and now e5, the promised Budapest Gambit. One of the best things about the Budapest Gambit is you get to play it on move two. There are a lot of pet opening lines where you may not get to play it against many opponents because they'll deviate before you get to use your pet line. However, when you're playing a pet line on move two, then you're really taking control of things at an early stage. Now, of course, white can't really hope for much of an advantage unless you capture on e5. So pawn takes on e5, knight to g4. The idea here is to try to win back the pawn in good circumstances, of course. It's a nice way to try to convert what is, you know, a closed system with d4 into a more open system. The Budapest Gambit, I think, often has similarity with more open systems that occur after e4. If you like those systems as black, this could be a good choice for you. Now, white has to do some awkward things to try to hold on to the pawn, and ultimately white usually doesn't keep the pawn on e5, but white can pick the right time to give the pawn back and get an advantage. Here, you can choose between knight f3 and bishop f4. Both are very viable, in this case, bishop f4 is played. If you're a greedy pawn grubber, this is probably your choice, because white keeps the pawn on e5 in more lines after bishop f4. Now, in this position, if you want to be really crazy as black, you can do what I've done in many games and play pawn to g5. This is a Chaba Bailoff's line, a Hungarian grandmaster, and it's just insane. It's also probably not very sound, but you can play it. I have, and it is it is very fun. One thing I should point out that you should not do is play bishop c5, which you would have played if the knight had gone to f3 instead of bishop f4, because the attack on f2 is well met here by pawn to e3 because the bishop is already outside the pawn chain. If you were forcing pawn to e3 with the bishop still in c1, you'd be much better off. So instead, after bishop f4, here we see knight to c6, which is a good move, threatening to regain the pawn, and now knight to f3, and in this position, bishop to b4 check. The check is a little bit awkward. So there are two lines here, and I want to point out one pretty line first. It's knight b to d2, which seems pretty secure, but there is a little bit of a trap here. Queen e7, and now white wants to play pawn to a3. The idea of putting the knight on d2 is that there's no chance to double the pawns, and so when you ask the bishop what to do, it seems like the bishop is in a really awkward spot, and white is going to gain a lot of space on the queen side to good effect. However, after a3, there's the nice move, knight captures on e5. And if you capture on b4, then you have knight to d3 checkmate, which I've been able to play in a few games, and it is a joy to play. However, white, of course, doesn't have to allow the smothered mate, and instead you can capture on e5. Black captures again, still threatening the mate, and now bishop takes e5. Since our bishop is hanging here, we have to throw in the intermediate move, bishop takes d2, and after queen takes, there's queen takes on e5. Now, this is a playable position for black, but it is a little bit better for white, and Rubinstein was really good with the major pieces, the queens and the rooks, and honestly, this is the kind of position that he probably would have done really, really well in with the white pieces. However, instead, he plays knight to c3. This is going to allow black to double the pawns over here, which can still lead to an advantage for white, but it's also going to give white a lot of problems in the long term to deal with. I've seen some great computer games where black has in the long term been able to score a victory, which is rare in computer chess, because of the long term damage to the pawns allowing them to be picked off. After knight c3, we see queen e7, getting ready to pick up the pawn on e5, so queen d5, the queen steps up and defends the pawn, but of course the queen is exposed here. Now we get bishop takes c3, pawn takes, and this is a little weird. Queen a3. This works out in the game, but the queen is being a little premature. In fact, the queen will often come to a3, but you should probably play f6 here, which is going to happen in a moment, and castle first without kind of lunging out with your queen with your king still in the middle of the board. 
However, white returns to favor with another inaccuracy. Rook c1, too passive, defending the c-pawn, but the best move according to the engines is an active move with the rook, and that can be either rook to b1, one open file, or rook to d1, taking a different open file. And the computer likes white after, for example, rook d1, and black can gain the pawn back, and then queen d2. White has the bishop pair, an open position, more development, more activity. So white is definitely significantly better here, and the lost time is a problem. So after rook c1, now black plays pawn to f6. Very common in the Budapest gambit saying, all right, I'm going to not try to win the pawn back on e5 anymore, so you're going to stay a pawn up, but I'm going to gain some time attacking your queen. Pawn takes on f6, knight comes back, the queen has to move, queen back to d2, pawn to d6, so the bishop is ready to come out. I jumped a move ahead by accident, but knight d4 now, and castles from black. Now, in this position, white is still better, but you have to play a computer move that I don't think anyone would play, least of all Ben Feingold. It's the move pawn to f3. This move secures the e4 square, and knight to e4 was a big, big problem. Of course, you're reluctant to play a move like pawn to f3, and when you're down in development and your king is still in the middle, take the slow route to finishing development. However, this was the right way to play. There's no way for black to refute this attempt, and white does preserve some kind of an advantage, although black has play. However, f3 is not played. That computer line, not chosen, and instead pawn to e3, which seems so much more natural, but now white has real problems in this position, and black is better. After pawn to e3, first we get knight captures on d4, and then after pawn takes d4, which makes sense, you know, queen captures just seems like you're losing time and you want to fix your pawn structure and you also don't want to open the e file. In this position though, there's knight e4. The queen is forced to move and after a queen check, the king is going to have to move and lose the right to castle. Queen c2. And now black is a little bit, a little bit imprecise. The best check was queen b4 check. And this is the best check because on b4, the queen covers b2 and in a moment, White can put the queen on b2 and survive a critical line. After king e2, bishop f5 here, this threat is a big, big problem, and black is actually just winning. However, in the game, queen a5 check is selected, and the queen is going to be very good here and maintain chances to come to the king side, which will matter, but objectively, this wasn't accurate. After king e2, in this position, if bishop f5, which was very, very good with the queen on b4, white can now just play this move. And it seems like there should be a follow-up, but in fact, there's no follow-up. It's actually quite okay for white in this position. Black has a lot of attempts and some advantage, but there's nothing decisive that I or the engine can see. So after king e2, though, with bishop f5 not working, black finds something much more direct. And it is the beautiful move, rook takes f4. Lovely. Giving up an exchange to rip open the e-file, which is going to be the source of a huge attack. So after rook takes f4, of course pawn takes is forced, and now bishop f5. Very simple idea. We're going to try a discovery and we're going to win the queen. And a secondary idea, rook to e8 unloading a huge attack on the e-file. So now the queen goes over to b2, and in this position, rook to e8. And this is a good moment to pause the video if you want to try and find a good defensive move in this position. In fact, the key square is f3. And <laughs> the move chosen is not the right move. The right move is pawn to f3. For the second time in this game, the white pawn needed to move up to f3. Now this looks like it's just losing because there's knight g3 check, king f2, and the rook falls on h1, and black is up a piece, but the king actually gets to safety, and in doing so, traps the knight, and white is actually better in this position, which is kind of insane. This, though, is not played. Instead, king f3, stepping immediately off of the e-file, which makes sense, of course, 
but now the king is not going to survive. It is too far forward in this position, and black does have methods of getting at it. Black starts with knight d2 check, and the king is forced over to g3. And black repeats with knight e4 check. Now, in this position, the big question is, why wouldn't you go back to f3? As white here, you must be fearing that you're about to be checkmated. You'd be very happy with a repetition here if black kept checking from d2 and e4. Well, my instinct is that black would not keep checking from d2 and e4, that black would take time and find a winning path. And in this case, the key is to push a kingside pawn, and you can push either of the kingside pawns. H5 is very effective, threatening bishop to g4 check, and there's not much way to meet that. If you try pawn g3 getting ready to pull back here, now you just have knight d2 check, king g2, bishop e4, with a skewer of the king and rook, and this is winning for black. You're not even going to take the rook because you've got some big checks coming. And uh, alternatively, if you try instead of g3, pawn to h3 here, trying to create some left, maybe you hide here if the knight starts checking, black just seals things off. Now there's no way to get out here, and knight d2 check is a huge threat, and black's attack is winning in this position. There's a lot of paths, but all are decisive. However, what I really want to show is my favorite line with the king on f3 in this position. It is the move g5. And after pawn takes g5, which at least avoids g4 check, there's now a nice bishop sacrifice. Bishop to g4 check. And here, the king really doesn't have a choice, right? You don't want to step back onto the e-file. And if you go here, you're simply losing the g-pawn with check as well. So you have king takes g4, queen takes g5 check. If you pull back to h3, this is just made on the spot. So you need to go back again to the critical f3 square. And in this position, I encourage you to pause your video and try to find the fastest way to checkmate. I will be tremendously impressed if you do find it. Well, there are multiple good paths. You can check on the F file here or here and then take on F2, or you have discoveries if the king goes to E3, and it's just an overwhelming attack, and the computer tells me it's mate in nine. But that's nine moves down the road. You've still got a lot of work to do, and you need to be precise, of course. Instead, you can finish things immediately in this position with the stunning knight G3. This is a move <laughs> that shows up in the computer suggestion list that just blows my mind. I'm like, really? That's mate in three? But it turns out that it is. After knight g3, there's a couple of really pretty points. The first is that the knight here is covering these two squares, and then the queen covers these squares, so you're threatening simply rook to f8, which is mate because there's no more e-file available to white anymore. And then if you capture the knight, you're blocking the g3 square, so both pawn takes with the h-pawn and pawn takes with the g-pawn simply lead to queen f5 and a really, really pretty mate. So this knight g3 move here, putting the knight on this empty square and just covering all moves by the white king and you know creating this creative, like self-trapped position uh, as well for white, where the knight gets captured and then the king is totally blocked in by its own pawns. It's just really, really beautiful. Again, mate and just two more moves. White can't really delay significantly at all. Beautiful move, knight g3. However, in the game, white did not go back to f3 after the knight checked on e4. So we didn't see these creative lines. Instead, the king stepped up with king h4. And this move just gets demolished directly. Rook e6, a great rook lift. The Budapest Gambit has a lot of nice rook lifts. Simple threat, rook to h6 mate. There's no way to hold things off, but white tries bishop e2, getting ready to block on h5. Rook h6 check, bishop h5, and now rook takes h5. A very, very nice sacrifice of the rook, but not too complicated, because after king takes, there's bishop g6, 
And this isn't just check, it's double check. You might have forgotten that the queen is participating along the fifth rank, but this is actually a double check, which is kind of funny. And here, Rubenstein resigned. In this position, of course, the king can only go to g4 or h4, and it doesn't matter which square you pick because queen to h5 is a beautiful, beautiful checkmate. What a special game by Vidmar in the Budapest Gambit, deploying the surprise opening and meeting with wild success. In fact, in his first three encounters with this uh, opening, Rubenstein lost all three. <laughs> that is that is just incredible at his level of chess. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you like it and you want to see more of my favorite chess games from the 2010s, then click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.